This week on the Death of the Reader Extended Cut, hear more from Simon Brett, hear more about the Detection Club, hear more goofy theories, hear more of Death of the Reader. You're listening to 2SER 107.3. This is Flex and Herds bringing you Death of the Reader, your murder mystery world tour. These mysterious tunes brought to you by Paul Meter, our audio extraordinaire. Today, Herds, you're tackling The Floating Admiral, written by The Detection Club. Well, thank you, Flex. Wait a second, The Detection Club? Who's the author? Well, I was hoping you'd read the introduction at the beginning of the book so you would, you know, go into this with a bit of understanding. I have some understanding, but I think I'd like to explain to us what's going on here. So, part of the Murder Mystery World Tour gimmick is that we're taking you around the world, connecting author to author, following their inspirations, their touchstones, everything that led them to be who they are. Mm -hmm. Last book we looked at was The Three Taps by Ronald Knox, and we've decided to branch out to Knox's compatriots, companions, contemporaries in the Detection Club, a group of some of the most prolific authors of the golden age of detective fiction. Yeah, and we'll be starting with The Floating Admiral, which uh, is a pretty a pretty tricky one, from what I understand. We're doing the, uh, the first four chapters just to kick us off for this episode. And yeah, the Detection Club, it's a group of like-minded murder mystery enthusiasts, uh, along with Knox and Agatha Christie and some others you might, may or may not be familiar with, just getting together and writing murder mysteries and challenging each other, which I think is really cool. Yeah, it's a club that still exists today, yeah. and uh, it got its foundations with uh, a little bit inspired by the Knox rules, which we spoke about on the previous episode, and we'll have a link up on the podcast so you can do a quick rundown to refresh your memory if you've forgotten what those are. Mm -hmm. But basically, the rules of fair play for the genre ended up being kind of some of the foundational pieces of literature for the Detection Club. Uh, So, The Floating Admiral is a very interesting story, and you might have heard me speak to Andrew Popel about it. It's a story where each chapter was written by a different author, and none of them told each other what the answer was meant to be. So it's basically a game of Chinese whispers, but with the murder mystery. Yes, it That's is. excellent. And apparently I'm being charged to, to solve this thing, despite the fact that it's being written by multiple authors, none of whom know what the answer is, and everyone's trying to, like, figure out what it is while they're writing it? Is that is that what's happening? Yeah, I've thrown you a bit of a curveball here. Yeah. You awarded me one point for the solving of the three taps <laughs> by Knox. Can I points? How many chapters are there? Yeah. <laughs> How many chapters are there for every one I get right? Do well, I get a point? Well, there's 12 chapters, the I conclusion get 12 points and then. the prologue. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you one whole point for it. You know what? I'll take it. <laughs> this is the best I'm going to get on this show. Actually, you know what? You know what? I will say, and we'll talk about this coming up a bit later in the show, but several of the reviews, both modern and contemporary of this novel, have said that Agatha Christie's solution to the story is worth the sales price of the book alone. Oh. So if you can get the official solution and Agatha Christie's solution, you can have three points. Oh boy. And that's part of this, isn't it? She's chapter four, isn't she? She's chapter four. Oh, I guess we'll have to see how I go later on then. My goodness. <laughs> I'm looking forward to it. Yeah. So it's one of these very, very strange things. You think when you have a puzzle, you'd like to know that it can be solved. Mm-hmm. But in this case, we have a puzzle where we don't know if we can solve it. It's almost by premise against the rules of Knox, where the mm. author should be letting you know that it's fair and solvable. We do also have that prologue, which apparently was written after the rest of the book was put together. Yes. So there might be some clues in there, I hope. I'm banking a lot on those. The prologue by G.K. Chesterton and the conclusion by Anthony Berkeley mm. are the two things that were written with the full knowledge of the book. So you've got a, you've got a little helping hand there with that introduction. Yeah, I'm hoping. I have some thoughts on that, but we'll, we'll get to that later. The, the description of G.K. Chesterton's prologue is typically paradoxical. It's great. So you you don't want to take that with uh, without your you know helping of salt. Your your powder keg full of salt. Is yeah. That <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the the club itself it was kind of a secret society, right? Did they like sell those books? I don't really know much about it. They did sell those books. The society was more or less secret, as I understand it, in terms of how to join and gain membership yeah. and what they actually did. You know, now it's all out in the open, searchable on Wikipedia, as Simon Brett in the edition that we're reading mentions in his uh, in his foreword. Speaking of that, we have Simon Brett himself 
former chairman of the Detection Club on the show a bit mm. later, so stick around for that. Yeah, he reckons it was founded in 1928, which is, you know, it's a pretty old society to still be around. Yeah, I think that when you approach this story and you think of the Detection Club, it's probably worth keeping in mind that this was like a bunch of friends with very differing opinions and views and writing styles who just like to meet for dinner and discuss murder mysteries. Yeah, well, it definitely has that feeling of fun to it. And that's something that's part of the foreword as well. Uh, that's the something that was kind of it's kind of been lost in in more modern murder mysteries, that feeling of fun, that feeling of, you know, we we can throw some of the the realistic rules, you know, some of the drama of crime fiction out the window and go for something a bit more lighthearted. Uh, even in the subject of murder, as the story is. Well, I wouldn't even necessarily say it's about lightheartedness. I think it's more just about the story being secondary to the game. For sure, yeah. Um, it's one thing that we've spoken about at length, the whole idea of murder mysteries as an old interactive medium. Mm. And I think that this is uh, is an example of that, you know, in kind of the same way that you might have like a mobile phone game, right? They're not exactly right. the most extensive plots or lore or backgrounds, yeah. but they're good time wasters and a good exploration of, you know, maybe some logic puzzles. Yeah, it's something to think about, try and puzzle out, try and figure out how each character fits into them in, into the story, but not worrying so much about the, dare I say, the moral at the end or the, the grander picture, because um, it doesn't matter as much. It doesn't matter how this murder mystery, you know, sets off a huge chain of events down the line. It's just about the moment, about the now. I was particularly impressed, aside from the prologue, which is very much out of character with the rest of the book, but <laughs> with intention, mind you. Mm -hmm. uh, but I was very much impressed with how all four opening chapters seem to fit and flow together. Yeah. There wasn't any moment in the first four where I really felt like, oh, that's where they switched authors, yeah. you know, even though it did tell us. One of the um, most interesting writing techniques that I noted, that I know that I noticed after every chapter, um, all of the chapters end on a cliffhanger or the introduction of a character or something that's sort of like a throw to the next writer. Like, Oh, and this is when we, I can't think off the top of my head, but like, this is when, you know, we're going to talk to the the niece of the Admiral, that we're going to go to their house. And then the next chapter is about that. Um, and in particular, jumping from the second to the third chapter where uh, we've, we've had our lovely chat with the niece and then the table is like, I just want you to stay in the house. And then she's just, she's just run away in a car, which is fantastic. Like the way that we, we kind of flow from chapter to chapter isn't just, this is the end. And then it's a new story. There's there's something, there's a call to action that's kind of thrown at the end of each chapter that we have to grab onto. Yeah, I think it's very much worth reading the introduction by Dorothy L. Sayers before you get to the story, mm. because they went into this this game of writing a novel split between a group of people um, with a set of rules on how they were going to approach it. Like, yep. one author could not throw in unnecessarily challenging details purely for the purpose of making it more difficult. Mm. Whether or not they succeeded <laughs> in would, that is an entirely different matter. I, I feel like that's definitely something that happened. We'll get into that. I mean, you've read the whole thing. You have a yeah. better idea of the, than I do, but I definitely feel like there are some clues that are thrown in that kind of contradict or completely reframe previous scenes, which is like... A little bit of a throw, but yeah. you know. But I do think that that was probably part of their game plan is that each chapter so. was meant to end yep. with, this is the puzzle piece that you were meant to pick yep. up on. Yep. I also like that uh, because most murder mystery novels, you tend to have that flow of chapters because you start off with the introduction. There's the big murder scene. And then there's this kind of slower introduction to the characters. And then things pick up again when complications start to rise. And then it, you know, peters out as the solution is resolved and the detective figures everything out, whatever. But uh, the thing that I really enjoyed about this novel is how every chapter, because it's written by a different author, they maintain that intensity all the way through. And I feel like that is a huge selling point um, if you want to like recommending it to someone, if you want to read something where every chapter has a significant clue and a different way of approaching the mystery, this is the one. Yeah, it very nicely follows where your headspace is as a reader, because each of the authors was trying to figure out what the hell was going on at the same yep. time you are. Yep. So you're never left behind by the author that you might be in one that is written by a single author. Yeah, they're almost trying to, like, I could imagine that the authors are trying to puzzle out the previous one, the previous chapters, while also pushing their own agenda in a sense, which is a really fun game of uh, of tag almost. Yeah, one thing that it does tell you in Dorothy L. Sayers' introduction is that at the end of the book, the appendices feature the solutions from every single author as to what they thought 
the outcome was meant to be. I am looking forward to reading those immensely because I hope, I hope that like half of them are like two sentences and that's it. And the others are like these full essays <laughs> on all these little details that go all the way back around and everything makes sense at the end. I was most excited to find out how many of them were the same and how many were just completely oh, different. I can't wait. So if I guess the right one and like Agatha Christie's is similar, do I get points for that? Anyway, I'll figure that out. No, you have to get theory and name matched. <gasps> I'll give it my best shot. Tell you what, if you can get every single author and their <laughs> theory by name, you can have 100 points. I will try. <laughs> I will try my best, sir. I'm excited. All right. Now, I think that probably the thing that is most egregious in this novel to me, the thing that I, I find least appealing about it mm. is that every character is treated as a vessel for exposition and little else. Yeah, that's fair. Because each author only has a set amount of time to have their moment in the spotlight. They want to get as much information and as many like hard clues out on the table as quickly as they can. Um, I do think this is particularly uh, a problem with uh, the, the, the lady characters in a sense that like, I don't feel like the representation is very well set out. I, I feel <laughs> like, as though being that kind and questioning about it is a disservice because yeah. it's pretty bad. It's it's pretty terrible. Like the, the two most prominent female characters are the niece who is immediately judged on how pretty she is and how she's married to someone who's important. And then the second lady, uh, Mrs. Davies, who we, we love, of course, she's a wonderful character, but... She just talks a lot. That's her only defining quality. Like, we've got two ladies who are ugly and talk a lot. Like, that's it. It's not a particularly well, uh, deeply explored, you know, facet of their lives or anything. It's just, here are two qualities that women have that are, there's like a negative thing. Let's play off of that. And that's that's it. Yeah. And not to um, say that the men are particularly well represented no. either, but there's nothing quite as stereotypical going on there. No. Yeah. It's not great. Um, but- then again, as we mentioned earlier, that is definitely not the focus. I, at least I hope not. I don't think that the focus is in any way a character study or any kind of deep and meaningful moral argument being made here. I hope not. Uh, it's definitely more on putting the pieces of the puzzle together and focusing on that. Given how forward thinking Knox was in his representation of women in his novel yeah. Three Taps, which we previously covered, I feel as though these characters are a victim more of the the premise of the story than yeah. they are of the whim of the writers. I, I for sure think so. The writers weren't thinking about how do we portray minorities? How do we portray women? How do we like forward think? They weren't thinking about that. They were thinking about the rules of the club that they've made. Um, and I wonder how much of their thought went into making a commercial product as opposed to just a game between friends, uh, which really is the feeling that I get from it. Yeah, I definitely would agree. It's a it's a big game between friends vibe. I think one of the other things that's interesting just in that general context of, you know, representing characters and making them personable is that it's kind of also just a product of using logic as a tool alone. Yeah. Like ignoring any human element to a situation, you can typically logically find one or more ways to justify a situation or action, but not considering the human element uh, is, mm. is going to leave you in hot water in that regard. And that's kind of what shows in this story in, that, in, in the regards to the characters. Right, yeah. Now the victim- mm -hmm for the floating admiral is in fact the floating admiral. What? That's crazy that the admiral would be floating and also be dead. Yes. Ad <laughs> admiral Peniston, which if you have children in the back seat of your car is spelt <gasps> the way they think. Oh my goodness. That's inappropriate. It is very. Uh, <laughs> also a real place in England. I oh, found cool. out in researching. Mm. There's a neat little map in the book, isn't there? Uh, yes. That's not the real place though. The town of Peniston is a real place. Oh, I see. I see what you mean. Yeah. Um, now, the Admiral is found in a situation which, as with many a murder mystery, simply does not make sense. Mm -hmm. He's found in a boat, in the river, stabbed through the heart in a large overcoat. The, uh, the rope down to the boat has been cut. Obviously, foul play is involved. And he's found by this uh, strange gentleman named Neddy Ware. Neddy Ware, who is totally innocent, I'm sure. <laughs> Definitely not affiliated with the the older gentleman. I guess they're both older gentlemen. We can talk like about your anyway, suspicions. We can talk look, about your suspicions okay. later on. I guess, yeah. I just want to say I'm thankful it's not a locked room mystery. Because that is a very interesting <laughs> detail about this story. Um, the locked room is an absolute staple is, of the murder yep. mystery genre. Literally. And 
I guess you could extrapolate on this being a locked room by some of the clues, but that's a very loose definition to take. Well, the the details that we have is that he's on a boat and it's the vicar's boat. So like somebody had to put him there. Exactly. <laughs> you know, so there are still some details that we can roll with immediately beginning the vicar anyway. Um, but yeah, we've got some details that we can roll with. We've got the first responder, which is Wes. Um, there's a detective who shows up not long afterwards. Um, there are plenty of characters who saw the Admiral the night before or were with them. Uh, the vicar in particular, uh, who is just sweating, uh, his niece who was wearing a white dress and maybe the vicar's sons. I feel like I'm trying to think there's any carries. I'm slipping out on the top of my head here. I do have some other theories. I feel like characters. by the time we've gotten through a list of characters, they've already slipped out the other end of the list. It's anyway. very true. It's very true. It doesn't honestly, if I'm going to be entirely honest with you, I did not remember any of the characters names. In fact, I thought it was his daughter for the longest time up, up right until about five minutes ago. I was like, Oh yeah, it's the Admiral's daughter. No wait, niece. What's her name? Fitz Fitzgerald. Is that it? Uh, her maiden name is Fitzgerald. Elma uh, yeah. Fitzgerald. Her married name is Elma Holland. Yes. Yes which is a whole mystery unto itself. Yes. <laughs> now, Herds. Yeah, Flex. As I've said, this is a challenging puzzle by by the nature of its premise. Mm -hmm. Do you think, given what you saw in the first chapter, knowing that each author was meant to push their own solution, mm -hmm. do you think that the book is solvable by the information provided in the first chapter alone? The first chapter alone? I don't think so. I don't know that that's a thing. Um... I would say with the first chapter in the prologue, I could make a pretty good guess uh -huh, uh -huh. Um, because I went back and listened to that just before the show started and I have some pretty good ideas. But the first chapter alone, I mean, it gives you Wes, it gives you the inspector kind of guy. There's some guy called Hampton who shows up and inspects the body. Like, I think that... And then there's, of course, the scene with the vicar where he... He denies everything, but then is immediately caught out on his denial. Like, I feel like Victor Whitechurch, when he read, or rather, when he wrote the first chapter, he was very clearly trying to, uh, like, I think that he did have an idea of who the killer was in his mind. I think that Wares and Vicar, uh, sorry, the Vicar, make the most sense. Um, I think that based on the first chapter alone, the Vicar has to be at least an accomplice, um, if not the killer. Like, that's just how I feel. Mm. Um but I, I feel like it's probably possible to make a theory. The problem is that it's not nearly long enough. And the author, Whitechurch, also part of his challenge is to write a story that can be permutated, right? Yes. He's trying to write something that you you could figure out what he was thinking, but it's probably not specific enough to nail it down. So I guess my answer to the question is no, I don't think it is possible to, you know, conclusively, uh, concretely nail down who the killer is. But- it should be a possibility, if that makes sense. I think that's fair. So you think that uh, it e either has to be the vicar or Nettie Ware? That's my thinking, just based off of the characters that are introduced, because they're the only ones we get any significant amount of time with. Um, I might go into that a bit more deeply when we get into our little discussion at the end, but like, I, I feel like he might also leave some room for the daughter because she's mentioned, even though she's not... Because that's also when you get into the discussion of Knox's rule of like, the character has to be introduced in the early part of the story. Is chapter one the early part of the story? Is the prologue the early part of the story? Where does that sit? Because you could argue that he mentioned the daughter so that she will be introduced later and therefore fit with Knox's rules, right? There's all sorts of ways you could kind of take that. And that's part of the puzzle. Um, but yeah, I, I do think that it is possible to reach a conclusion that is in lining with what uh, Whitechurch intended. But I think that part of that intent is also that any number of solutions could be valid. We'll speak a bit more about those solutions as we press on in the story, but right now I'm very excited. We have Simon Brett, author of the foreword of the edition of the book we're reading, acclaimed author in his own right, and former chairman of the Detection Club. Up next. You're listening to 2SCR on 107.3, and this is Flex and Herds with Death of the Reader, your Murder Mystery World Tour. Today we have a very special guest with us, uh, Mr. Simon Brett, from all the way over in the great England itself, once president of the Detection Club. Simon, how are you doing today? I am very good, thank you. 
That's excellent. That's excellent. Uh, our resident flex here has actually read one of your novels. I, I hear it's uh, it's called A Decent Interval. So this is a real treat for him. Yeah. When I was first getting into detective fiction and going from a casual reader of it to a, you know, keen solver of the stories, some of the Charles Parrish novels were the first ones that I <laughs> got into to actually... Uh, figure out how the genre works. So it's very exciting to get the opportunity to speak to you, Simon. Oh, well, you're clearly a man of, of discrimination. <laughs> <laughs> I, look for, I look forward to reading the novel myself when I can get around to it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I wanted to ask you, you're quite the writer yourself. Uh, you've been penning murder mysteries since 1965 uh, with cast in order of disappearance. I'd just like to ask why yeah, did you... Yeah, actually 19... 19- 75. He's 75, rather. Yes, indeed. Yes. I'm, Why did I'm, you... I'm quite old, but not that old. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you start writing initially, Simon? Um, it came directly out of my day job at that time, which mm. was being a radio producer, would you believe? Oh, and I would. I was working at the BBC, and I was delegated to produce a series of adaptations of the Dorothy L. Sayers, Lord Peter Whimsey stories. And um, I'd always been a bit frightened of mystery fiction up until that point. You know, I thought you needed a computerized brain to work out the plot. Um, But in fact, as I worked very closely with the guy who was adapting the book, the writer called Chris Miller, Mm. I got less frightened of the genre um, because I found, well, we found some lovely things like great big holes in Dorothy Elso's plots, which was very encouraging. Um, (laughs) But also I found that character and dialogue were at least as important as the plot. And so I thought, well, I don't know whether I can do a uh, plot. And there are still newspaper critics of this opinion, but um, I think I can do character and dialogue. And that's what got me into writing the first of my Charles Paris actor detective murder mysteries. Yeah, I was going to ask you, actually, Mr. Mr. Charles Paris, you've had him for a very long time. And you recently put out a novel in, in, in 2018 uh, with the, the detective still in, the, in his role. Why has he stuck around for so long? Um, I think, uh, I mean, each of the the books is about a different aspect of show business. Mm. And I'm fascinated by show business. Um, And Charles Paris is, uh, you know, also you can, I mean, writing writing crime novels gives you a wonderful sort of carte blanche to investigate subjects you're interested in. And through the, you know, your protagonist and the mechanics of the sort of, the, you know, the plot, um, you can just go on doing that. And so, I, I mean, I wrote, um, I think I got up to 17 Charles Paris books, sort of mm. one a year. And then I left him for about 15 years. But in that interim, lots of interesting developments had happened in show business. So I thought there was suddenly lots more to write about. So I came back and wrote more about him. Is he your, your favourite detective? I know you shouldn't play favourites in writing, of course, but... Um... Um, I write other series, but I think Charles is um, hes the one whose values I find very easy to understand because they're pretty close to my own, I think. Mm, for sure. Yeah, and actually, you mentioned earlier that you were a, a radio producer. I did some research. I, I found that you actually hosted a radio panel called Foul Play, in which you... you I did, yes. Yeah, which I'd still smell that. mystery panel show, which uh, ran for a couple of series. It was enormous fun. I mm. mean, it was... The way it worked, I, I chaired it, well, I wrote it and chaired it, and mm. we had two very clever uh, impro actors who I'd sort of, you know, I'd give them the brief of what their character had done, and then they were they were cross-examined by uh, two other crime writers, and uh, the format worked very well. Uh, just one last question. Uh, how can we copy that idea successfully, Simon? <laughs> oh, by negotiating with my agent for a huge fee for the format. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Uh, we'll, be on, we'll be on the phone as soon as we're off with you. <laughs> okay. Now, I wanted to turn this a little bit towards the Detection Club, which you were the, uh, the president of. Yes, I, I was the president of. I, I gave it up about um, four years ago but, yeah. uh, to a younger man called Martin Edwards. Mm. But uh, no, I was president for 14 years, so I... Yeah. I know it fairly well. The uh, the novel that we're covering alongside our chat with you here is The Floating Admiral, which you wrote a foreword oh, yeah. to. Um, and we had we had lots of fun picking apart that mystery and seeing, you know, how the various authors constructed their different parts of the puzzle. Yep. Um, but I wanted to ask, in your fo- foreword, you noted that the club has opened its doors a lot broader since the initial days of the Detection Club to the genres of crime fiction at large, whereas back in the beginning it was something of a secret society. What do you think yes, led to it, that it widening was, of the gate? 
Yeah. I, I mean, I think it's because the genre has changed so much. And in fact, um, a few years ago, we did a sort of sequel to The Floating Admiral called, would you believe, The Sinking Admiral, um, which was written by 14 current members of the Detection Club. And that was much more difficult, because I can, and I know because I edited it, because back in, well, it was published about 1930, uh, The Floating Admiral. And then, although they were very different, the contributors, like, Dorothy L. Sayers, Agatha Christie, uh, E.C. Bentley, um, G.K. Chesterton, although they were different in their styles, they were writing very much the same kind of whodunit mystery. So they could literally write a chapter and pass it on to the next one to sort of sort out the plotting, whereas it was a much more complex operation when I did it because, you know, there were legal thrillers, there were financial thrillers, there were um, all kinds of different subgenre of the, of the the mystery. And do you think that the the broader scope that crime fiction has these days ultimately makes a better story, or do you think it's more just the fact that it's a reflection of the times? I think there are a lot of um, reasons why. I mean, we look back to the golden age, which was the 20s and the 30s, and um, I, th- I think what happened was the Second World War was very important in the development of, of the mystery because up until then, you know, a lot of the classics of the golden age, as it's called, were really very playful, you know, and they were, they were jokey about murder and death. Um, and I think the Second World War, when, you know, very few families didn't know somebody who was a casualty, uh, that made it slightly less tasteful. And also, I think all the good sort of, you know, clockwork toy plots had been done and the mystery had to change. And the other thing, which I think was very significant in um, English uh, mystery, was the end of the death penalty, um, where suddenly, you know, it was great in the days of Agatha Christie, where uh, Hercule Poirot could gather everyone into the library at the end and say, you know, you couldn't have done it because you were wearing the wrong side of of trousers and you couldn't have done it because of your blood group and all this. Therefore, the murderer was you. And he points the finger at somebody and the reader knows that that person is going off to the gallows. You know, end of story. Suddenly, when you don't have a death penalty, you get sort of lifetime sentences and you get, you know, people being released at the end of their sentences, that kind of thing. Um, And I think it became, you know, whereas it had been very black and white, it became... Somebody, Shades of Grey, there might be a title for some kind of book in there, I don't know. (laughs) Um, I think particularly what interests me about what you said there was the idea that, you know, all of the clockwork puzzles had been done. Clearly there are still modern examples of, like, classic detective fiction. How do you think that the genre can still innovate on those clockwork puzzles, even though so many of the possibilities for the closed room have been done, per se? I think it's pretty difficult, and I have great admiration for people who, you know, can come up. I mean, I think I think there are a lot of writers out there who are very good at doing twists, you know, where something is totally unexpected, and, you know, as you read, you go, oh, gosh. Um, but I can think of very few that are based on sort of one simple device. I mean, like, you know, let us say that the narrator is the murderer. Well, we all know that's been done many times. Um, I mean, the only post-war example I can think that is a really effective uh, twist murder based on one central device uh, is A Kiss Before Dying by R. Levin, which I think is, a, is that. I won't say what it is, but it's based on one very simple, almost grammatical device, and um, that works brilliantly. And I think people have been trying to replicate that, but not actually with, with marked success. Yeah, I think... Uh particularly looking back on the classic days of detective fiction, we have things like Willard Wright's 27 rules for uh, the genre and Ronald Knox's decalogue of fair play for the genre. Um, Are those things still treated with any level of seriousness? I know that originally Knox wrote his rules kind of just poking fun, as you say authors back then did, but is is there any attention paid to those structures and forms that were laid out back then in the modern age of crime fiction? 
I think, uh, I mean, as you say, you know, the, the Knox one was very much tongue-in-cheek. But, uh, but I think, I mean, there were good, you know, it did make some points about the cliches or uh, the <laughs> memes or tropes of the, <laughs> of the genre, um, you know, in, in a fairly uh, amiable way. I would say the one rule that um, kind of was in there and you should still obey is that the, you know, if you're doing a murder mystery where it's a whodunit, you want to know who did it, it is important that the actual perpetrator is introduced fairly early in the book, that so you don't suddenly sort of parachute them in in the penultimate chapter. Um, I think that rule still obtains, but most of the others are kind of, you know, were just fun, really. Yeah, I know that there's several stories we've been covering and investigating that have made various deconstructions of their own of those uh, of those forms of the genre from back in the day. But Simon, thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful to speak with you about all things of your own writing and the Detection Club. Well, it's a great pleasure. Where can people uh, best look into where to track you down? Well, I would think my website is probably the best place to start, which remarkably is called simonbrett.com. Um, I actually got ahead of the... Uh, <laughs> I grabbed that quite quickly. Um, so that might be the best place to start to find out about me and my book. Well, fantastic. I hope you've all enjoyed hearing from Simon Brett. It's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you, Simon, and I'm a particular keen fan of Charles Parrish, and I can't wait to get back into those stories. Uh, Great. You're on 2SER. This is Death of the Reader. That was Simon Brett, and you're investigating the floating admiral. You're on 2SER 107.3. This is Death of the Reader, your Murder Mystery World Tour, and we are talking about The Floating Admiral by the Detection Club, discussing chapters one to four. I've read the whole thing. Herds has only read to chapter four. Mm -hmm. And today we are going to try and get him to solve it with that information alone. And when I say get him to solve it, I mean quite the opposite. I mean, you mean solve every chapter individually, <laughs> because that's basically how this thing is written. It's great. It's great. I'm looking forward to this, guys. Look, I got this in the bag. Yeah, I mean, so far, already in the story, we've had five different authors. Uh, We're four chapters and a prologue in. Well, yeah. You have a lot of solving to do for very little story. It's okay. I got this. I got this. This is my my introduction into the ring. I got my mitts on. I got my... <laughs> I guess if you like my notepad and pen, it's very hard to hold those in these mitts. But you know what? I'll give it my best shot. So, yeah, I've got some theories. I've got some thoughts. I think that I'm sticking with my idea that every chapter probably has a different criminal, which uh -huh, is fantastic uh -huh. for me. But I'm going to try and nail down who I think the the, the ultimate killer is. So I'm going to run through my process a little bit here because we got a couple of characters that I find particularly suspicious. That's Ware, that's the vicar, uh, the admiral's niece, not daughter, uh, Fitzgerald. Um and that's it. Just those three. Those are the three that I find the most suspicious. I suppose Holland as well. You don't suspect the Vickers boys? I, I mean, they haven't really been in the story. I suppose they could be part of the solution. But um, just based on what we have here, I'm not going to suspect them. Because we haven't even seen them on screen more than once. When they were like, oh boy, can we, golly gee, can we go off and find the, the bloody murder knife? And the, and the detective's like, yeah, sure, kid, do it, whatever you want. Maybe well, you'll even find it. Isn't that the perfect moment for them to run off with the murder and just weapon take in their away? back pop? I feel like they could have done that anyway. They had all night to stash the thing. I feel like... <laughs> 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 I feel like out of, the, out of all the characters, those four, I would... Holland, I'm less suspicious of just because he seems so obviously a rube by the way that he's presented. He's all, oh, I've got to go here and do this and do that. And he seems like a fool. He's like the butler. Do you think that Holland was pinned as the culprit by one of the authors you've read so far? Probably, probably. Uh, oh, so far? Maybe Christy, maybe Christy. I'm I'm still debating that one because she obviously thinks that Holland is important because she has the Admiral come and like ask for him. Now remember, you're going to get bonus points for getting Christy. Right. I will, I will. So I'm I'm gonna I'm still thinking about Holland over there. That's the part that I'm kind of going back and forth. But let me run you through my thought process. So the vicar, 
particularly interesting to me because he's only been in one one chapter really so far, but he is suspicious as heck. He fumbles his words and he doesn't know what he's saying. And when he's asked questions, he's like, yes, the dress was definitely hidden and no, it wasn't. And it was in the trees, but it wasn't actually. And I could see everything and the amber was definitely there and he wasn't. It was, it's a load of garbage. I think the vicar is an accomplice at the very least. Okay. Uh, you make no mention of the fact that his hat was in the boat and- His hat was in the it boat. It was his boat. That's all. Those are also clues I picked up on. Point is- you don't, that's a less important. You don't. You don't think that. You don't think that that's a little too suspicious. You don't. Think I don't that think so. As an accomplice, he would have been, you know, scared to go out with this plan if Here's it was thing. his equipment that was left it's, there. It's entirely possible he's been strong armed into this, or somebody else is using his equipment. I don't think that it is actually him who killed uh, anyone. That's where I'm at right now. I think it's more likely Ware or uh, or Fitzgerald. Um, where I find particularly suspicious because the way that he's introduced, I've never listened to one of these on, uh, on an audiobook before, but the way that the narrator portrays where is very like, yup, sure thing. Absolutely. Don't worry about me. I am a side character and I will just do whatever you say, main characters. I feel like he has to know what's going on. Really? That's where I'm sitting at. I think, uh, especially because there's some focus on on the uh, the trajectory of the river and the tides. I think there's some funky thing where either Ware has asked the vicar to put his boat out, his boat out at a certain time, or it was meant to go out to sea, but it's come back in. Like it's such a strange way to dispose of a body. Maybe it's a setup to make it seem like he's innocent. Well. The way that you're pitching it right now makes it sound like the vicar was an un, like an unaware accomplice. So Maybe. Surely he would have just fessed up if that was the case. I don't know. I don't know where to put the vicar. I don't know if he's unaware or he's been strong armed into it. That might have something to do with the um uh, with the marriage with Holland. Here's here's the other thing. Yeah. Is that the de- detection club was a group of mostly devout Christians, including it's true. including priests. It's true. Do you not think that it would have been against the general modus operandi of the group to frame a you know church man as a guilty party in their own story? Ah, it's oh, that's a good question, isn't it? That would be very playing against type, though, wouldn't it? And ah, oh, you got me with a good one. I mean. It's possible. I think that that would also be a very fun thing to do to portray. This is when this is when you know a good man goes bad or something like that. Or maybe, as you say, maybe it is the vicar's sons. They're the accomplices, and the vicar is like trying to cover for his kids. Maybe that's what's happening. Maybe that's the that's the twist. You reckon? Yeah, maybe. Who knows? I think I think that that could also possibly explain why the vicar's alibi is so clearly rehearsed. Yes, that was something that I was going to mention. He says, I put my hat on the hat stand at 9.20, and that's exactly when I got here. And don't you worry about where I was at any other time. That's the only time that matters. Um, the way that he talks is just so, like, stilted and, like, I have this, I have this idea in my head. I think he might be trying to cover for his boys. But I'm not 100% on the vicar. I don't think he's a killer, though. Certainly not in chapter one. Um, I also had some suspicions about Fitzgerald, mostly because of the fact that she's wearing that white dress. Um, and I don't recall exactly what the vicar says, but I know he says that uh, he, he saw her running around in the dress and it was like, oh, but it wasn't like, isn't that weird that you only noticed her and no one else? Da, 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 da. Um, the Admiral is wearing a coat, implying perhaps that it was cold the night before. Um, I would argue that maybe that's a clue to kind of uh, to obscure the fact that the the daughter, sorry, the niece, you know, they killed the admiral and then their coat got all bloody, so they had to take it off and toss it in the river or something. And maybe that'll be revealed later. Um, but I think that by far the character that I'm most suspicious of is Ware because they are the first responder. They are the person who seems to be drawing the least attention to themselves in the first chapter while still being on screen. Um, like even Hempton, the the guy who like leans out, is like, oh, there's a, there's a newspaper here. I should look at it, but I will put it right back. Um, he even has more interaction with the corpse, right? Um, I feel like where is the most suspicious? And the thing that kind of set me on this path eventually, um, the thing that kind of concretely set my mind that at least initially that where is is the killer is the prologue. Um, and this is because of something that you told me because I didn't realize how the prologue was being written. I was under the impression the prologue was a prompt and that chapter one was being written after that. Um, but I went back and I re-listened to the prologue after learning that the prologue was written after the whole story was done. And we only really get three or so important characters. 
arguably two, but I'm going to say three for the sake of this narrative I'm going to push. We have two captains. We have the captain who is a paradox of codes and religious uh, leanings, and but he's just a good guy. So that's the vicar, right? No. <laughs> the vicar. So here's the problem. A captain does not become a vicar. A captain, however, could become an admiral. Or, as the second captain was introduced, all lick it up and full of opium. Keep the kids away from this one. This one's getting all PG and stuff. That captain could be court-martialed and be demoted to petty officer, which where's is. Where's is a petty officer. I'm just saying maybe the two captains in the intro are where's and uh, P- Peddington, was it? Peniston. Peniston, close enough. <laughs> Are you just That's trying to get me to say that as often as you can? Yes, obviously. <laughs> Why else would I do it? Yeah, I'm terrible with names. I'm, I apologize in advance. Uh, but yeah, I think that that's what's happening is that the prologue has taken this end situation that, you know, after all the clues have been laid bare that, you know, these two uh, Navy officers are the, you know, the kind of crux of the story and said, well, where where did they first meet or where did they have their, their altercation? I think that Wares um, is the intoxicated officer uh, who or rather captain who then was demoted to petty officer and then through the other captains, you know, righteous service of like wanting to help the little guy and all that sort of thing has been pulled up to uh, to uh, Admiral Hood. And then Wares was jealous, killed Penison, uh, and that's that's the motive there. That's what I think is going on. Um, I also think based on the description of the niece, she might be that woman who got thrown in the opium den at the start, which is a bit more of a stretch, but... Do you Why think, else would she do be you there? think then that that is perhaps the justification for the description of her appearance that perhaps Maybe, they're trying yes. to hint at that introduction? I hate to say it, but I think that might be. Um, I think that this idea of like, oh, she's been on hard times. She's been through some crazy stuff. Also, the mention that she's not his real niece, maybe. Do you think that that was intentional by the author that wrote that she was unattractive? Or do you think that that was, you know, tied around back at the end by Chesterton? Uh, Oh, that's a good point, actually. Yeah. I mean, oh, it's a good question, actually. Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure about that one. That's that's where it kind of becomes difficult to unravel because obviously I'm using the this is one of those fun things that you can do in, in murder mysteries using the structure to kind of puzzle things out. Um, I'm not that's sure. That's my move. I, yeah, I know, right? <laughs> I'm just turning it right back at you. But yeah, I think that um, I don't know that that was intentional when it was originally written. Just writing that she was unattractive. I think that the intent in writing her as unattractive originally uh, was to show that there was something more to her marriage than than love. Well. I guess something less, we would argue. <laughs> something less than love, you know, more than money. Contentious, contentious. Yeah. I think that that may w- be what's going on there because we're explicitly told as well that um, Fitzgerald doesn't get doled up for her her fiancé. She doesn't get doled up for him. She she does it on seemingly random nights. And maybe there's another man involved. Maybe she just likes makeup. She just likes the feeling of makeup on her skin. Maybe she has a tall mirror that she asks who is the most beautiful of them all, and it's Snow White. She has to go... Take her heart or something, you know? All right. <laughs> How's uh, that sound to you, Flex? It, it sounds plausible. It, yeah. sounds, it sounds like your theory has shifted since we sat down in this room. That's the fun Which part. I can neither say is a good nor bad thing. <laughs> However, what I will tell you is this, Herds. I think rubbish to you, sir. What? Here is what I think really happened, Herds. Okay. The prologue is the make-believe story that the Vickers boys were playing with the Admiral. What? And things went awry. Oh my goodness. The boys set up this scene of damsel in distress and rescue with the Admiral and his niece. The niece decided to wander off, you know, the care that she needed in that prologue. Uh Uh-huh. And then the boys were left, well, you know, what do we do here? Well, obviously we have a play sword fight. This sounds like rubbish. This sounds like double rubbish. (laughs) This sounds like it's compounding. You're like, how can I possibly counter this totally factual recollection of events and you're like play sword fights why would no one fess up about any of this well because they're two immature boys and the vicar doesn't know wouldn't the vicar find out i feel like he'd be able to like ask his damn kids what they were doing you think that you think and they were so excited to find the murder weapon what are you talking about well that's obviously their cover story (laughs) ben come on if they're two women if they're Here's the deal. If they are young enough to be having sword fights, they are not old enough to know how to cover up a murder weapon. That's not, that doesn't work. Oh, come on. I reckon, I reckon at the sprightly old age of 14, I could have covered up a murder weapon. No, 
No, B disagrees. You live alongside a river. Just toss it in. That's a good cover right there. Oh, but then why would you go looking for it? They'd be all sheepish. That's nonsense. Well, because they need an excuse to go out and play Here's for the, the day when the Here's vicar the might be asking them Here's to the do deal. their homework. Here's the deal. The problem is if you're writing a murder mystery and your little boys and girls know something they shouldn't, you're going to write, they snickered or they shifted uncomfortably. They are not going to be enthusiastic about your murder investigation into the murder maybe, they indirectly caused. Maybe you've just been sense. misled by well-laid red herrings. No! Ben. Maybe their excitement is the, the thrill the, of the crime. But then what's the point of all the other characters? What's the point of all the other characters? <laughs> well, we have to understand how we ended up in this situation because obviously- mm. You know, we had to have some kind of romance that led to the inspiration between this story because you can't just have a sword fight over something that isn't a romance. Why That's just the, not well to do. Why so. are the 14 year old kids interested in romance? <laughs> because they're being raised by a church man, you know? I suppose so. <laughs> That's awful. That's awful. Here's that doesn't the thing. follow at all. One of the fascinating things for me in trying to dissuade you from the truth in this story. Because is I've obviously it, found it. That I'm I very have, close to it. I yeah. have 13 truths to dissuade you from. <laughs> I suppose so. <laughs> I've obviously found one of them because that is outlandish at best and, and unethical at worst, sir. So. Well, you know, I got, to lay a, I got to lay a bit of a sporadic wild one so that we, when we get to next time, when I present something more believable, you're more likely to go for it. Fair enough. I see. <laughs> and that is a tactic that I would love to use, mind you. Although Potney was a good one. Um... <laughs> Yeah, no. I mean, I'm I'm sick with Mr. Ware. I think he's like pretty I don't know if you could pull me away from him. The fact that you're not telling me anything about him indicates to me that I'm on to something. Well, the thing I will say about Ware. Yeah, let's go. Is that at this point in the story, he was also the one I suspected. Fair enough. For very similar reasons, the okay. prologue included. Good. It is mentioned in about the first 30 sentences of the book that he's a sailor. Yes. And the previous he's a petty officer. Yeah. Yep. And you know, I, I think that there's some well-laid clues here, but I do think, Herds, I do think mm. that in a story with 13 authors, if you're trying to pin down something that can be ascertained within the first 30 sentences of the fir- third chapter, you are discrediting the vast skill of mm. the writers we have at hand. I don't think that's what I'm doing at all. I think I'm taking very clear connections and making a web out of them, and that's how I be. It, because this seems that, less because, like a web and more like a straight line to me at this point. Well, that, that's because we're using the prologue. If you like, because when I first read through, I completely disregarded the prologue. I couldn't understand it. None of it made any sense to me. I said that we haven't been given any names. I don't understand why we're talking about these captains when it's an admiral that's been murdered. Um, it was only after rereading that in the first chapter that I started to really consider this theory in the first place. Now, Herds, I have entitled this battle The Crux of Christie. Why would you call it that? Because, as I mentioned <laughs> earlier on this day, the Agatha Christie solution to the story is said to be worth the admissions price of the book alone. Yep. Now hurts. Oh, no. Does this to you scream that Agatha Christie's solution that she was thinking of is the best, the most accurate, the least accurate, but most entertaining? Probably that one. It probably means it's as far from the actual truth as you can get, and it's probably very complicated. Now, I'm trying to recall, that was just a conversation with Mrs. Mrs. Davies. It was indeed. Yes, it was It was the mostly conversation chapter, uh, which was excellent, by the way. I would way. have entitled it entirely conversation, <laughs> mind you, but <laughs> not to worry. Yeah, I think, because the main piece of information that we kind of learned from that chapter is that uh, the Admiral could not have gone to London, so somebody must have brought in the newspaper, and that the Admiral came to the inn where she's at and was all... Is Mr. Holland here? And then I don't remember what response he got. It was probably no. Well, and then he went away. He got the response, which was, we'll go fetch him. And then he That's said, right. not the matter. I right. need to leave anyway. Yes. So, oh man. And if that in fact was the Admiral, he couldn't have been the one lying in the Vicar's boat because he would have been on a train instead. You're absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct. So it was probably someone else. I mean, there are so few options. It could be the vicar as an accomplice, but I don't think that like makes a lot of sense for him to do that. He's a churchman after all. He would never get invo- involved in murder. Um, I think it's more likely Holland himself, honestly, if I had to pick a character. Um, you don't think that Mrs. Davis would have recognized one of her own patrons? Not if you were wearing a disguise like a coat or something that the Admiral normally wears. I don't know. Mrs. Davis seems like a pretty <laughs> keen eye in many ways. I suppose. Hmm. 
I'm trying to recall exact how the timing would line up. Well, that's the thing is that it wouldn't really, would it? Unless there's like, t- t- well, unless it's twins, but I don't think we haven't been prepared for twins we at all. We have not been no. prepared for twins. And I, will, Knox, I will put that I, on the mm, table. I'm gonna side with I'm gonna side with Father Knox, Knox on this one. Yeah, fair enough. Um, now I I will say that if it was the vicar, mm-hmm. you know, then he would have been on his way to London by the time that they came to rouse him in the morning to let him know about the crime. Right. If it was Holland, he wouldn't have been able to barge back into the house when we visited there earlier on in the story. If it was Nettie Ware, he was well known to the village, as was the first sentence of description of him in the entire story. Mm. What else could it have been other than the vicar's two boys standing on each other's <laughs> shoulders? Hold on. Do we actually get told? <laughs> Let's take a one though. Wearing the Admiral's coat, it makes so much sense. Uh, but as you say, the keen eye of Mrs. Davies uh, is is testimony in and of itself. Exactly. She could be lying, I suppose. Um, Does this make you think that there's perhaps a character important to the story who we have not been introduced to yet? Oh, I mean, obviously. We, we have, like, we've been had a... Hold on. You say that like we haven't had a character introduced us in, like, every damn chapter. We've had, like, four so far. <laughs> However, it's going to be a new one every chapter. As as your trusting compatriot, one uh-huh. would one would hope that I had presented you an adequate challenge in the first four chapters of the book, and thus uh. the people you needed to solve the mystery. So, what is this mysterious extra person? I don't know. I don't know. I'm Does this person out. exist I don't at think all? So. There can be no. Do mysterious you think person Mrs. X? Davis is in on the crime, and this is her alibi? No, that's insane. I mean, it might be. That'd be pretty fun, though. <laughs> I I think I think that. They called for Mr. Holland, and it was probably a male. I at least trust Mrs. Davies as much to figure out as it's a it's a male individual. Um, so the only reason they could be calling for Mr. Holland would be to either confirm their alibi or to give them something or you know interact with them. I think I think that confirming the alibi of Mr. Holland would probably be the main goal. Um, oh, it's a tough one. Christy, why do you torture me so? Ah, uh, yes. And this, sir, uh, is why we have rounded out here. This is no. why we finished on chapter four. You know what? It's fine. I'll give another whack in the next roundabout fight, I suppose. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to say it was Holland calling from himself when there was some altercation, but that's that's not my final answer. I'm coming back for you, Chrissy. Oh, boy. I'm coming for you. All righty. Well, thank you for joining us on Death of the Reader here on 2SER 107.3. Next week, we will be discussing chapters five to eight of The Floating Admiral, starting with Inspector Rudge begins to form a theory by John Rowe. Oh, boy. We'll have to see if we can even trust Inspector Rudge's theory. I hope we can. Are you saying that Inspector Rudge is a suspect? I had not even considered him. You know what? I will make no confirmations nor denials. Oh, so, man. I'm scared. <laughs> see you then.